I'd like to start by acknowledging the uh, education sponsors for this, uh, this show, which is uh, Sesso Canada Stone Machinery and the organizer, which is the Trazo Tile and Marble Association of Canada, which I happen to be on the board of directors of. So very proud that we can have this great show uh, in Toronto. Um, I see the technical difficulties have not been resolved yet, so I'll fill in some more time. I'll introduce myself. My name is Todd Velikas. I uh, work for Schluter Systems Canada. Uh, Schluter Systems uh, employs me as a commercial manager for the province of Ontario. So I call, I've been with the company now for 18 years. And recently, uh, my role has partially changed to product management. So I get to be involved with, with trends in, in the industry and developing products for these upcoming trends, which is very exciting. I've only been doing this for two, uh, the product management for a couple of months, but the, uh, the learning process has been very, very exciting. So I got a chance to go to coverings this year and prepare for this presentation and, and went and saw a lot of presentations by a lot of different, uh, you know, the Italian and Spanish uh, con uh, tile associations and they were showing us what, what's new. So I tried to incorporate as much as that into my presentation as possible. Thank you. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a bit about the conditions uh, that are changing in the marketplace uh, that are driving the changes in how we design kitchens and bathrooms. Um, we'll talk a bit about the materials and the materials can cause the change as well. So for example, uh, the new thin gauged porcelain tiles and panels um, created a need for other materials to be able to install those products. Um, curbless showers that we'll talk about is another one. It, it changes the way it's built because the old way of building a shower, you cannot build a curbless shower. You have to come up with a new way of constructing it and we'll go through that as well. I'll go through the list of trends that we see in kitchens and baths, kind of bullet, bullet points. And then we'll take a look at the installation, what goes in behind these trends to make them successful. So changing in uh, consumer preferences. Everybody knows about the baby boom and the aging population. I'm approaching that area as well myself. And we just spent uh, at home a lot of money on renovating our house that we're going to live in for the foreseeable future. And in a lot of cases, cost was not a consideration. It's what we wanted, um, and we're going to get what we want. So the other uh, thing that somebody mentioned to me is property value. So for example, tile, uh, the price of a tile hasn't changed very much in the last 20 years, but the property values have. So if you spent, for in this example here, 10 years ago, $25,000 on a renovation of a bathroom, that would represent 10% of the value of the house. Today, that $250,000 house is a million bucks. But the cost of the renovation is roughly the same. So the percentage of the value of the home is a lot less. So people are willing to spend more money as a percentage of the value of the home. And the media, the wonderful media that shows people all these wonderful ideas and designs and people see these great things in high-end hotels and want that creates the demand. So things like personal spa bathrooms, designer kitchens, you know, kitchens that people want to live in as opposed to having a closet kitchen. So maintenance, mod uh, people are, are looking at things that are easy to maintain, um, easy to modify, the remodeling process. Uh, nobody wants their house to be under construction for eight months, especially if it's a kitchen. 
or a bathroom if it's the only one in the, in the unit. And uh, we want to add value to the, to the already valuable property. So you can see here the projected, uh, the projected population that's over uh, 65 is going to more than double in the next uh, 20 years. And that population has a lot of money to spend on these renovations and they want something nice. So I'm going to go through the tile benefits pretty quick because tile and stone has huge benefits over other materials that you can build with. Uh, ease of maintenance, very easy to adapt. You can take tile and, and stone and adapt it to whatever configuration of design that you have. Um, it's cost effective. People think the tile in stone is expensive and it really isn't when you take a look at the longevity of the installation. Um, durability. Uh, I'd renovated my shower because it was a closet shower, you know, with the little door and it looked terrible. But the rest of the bathroom being made out of uh, covered in marble is still current and, uh, and still in great shape. So all I had to do is replace the shower. And it's easy to repair. Now we'll talk about large porcelain panels. That might be a little bit of a different story in terms of repair. But typical tiles, you can replace one tile if it gets, jam gets damaged. And style, and we'll go through a lot of style uh, trends in the next few slides. And in most cases, it's easy to install. And we'll show you installation Upgraded materials and designs. So we have large format tiles. That is a huge trend right now. They're heavier, thicker in some cases, and a lot of them are thin and light. There's adhesives and sealants, uh, vapor retardant membranes. Um, the, the research and development in the tile industry over the last you know, 10, 15 years has been enormous. So not only does the tile change, there's setting materials, membranes, waterproofing, all these features are, have, have grown and, and expanded over the last number of years. So let's take a look at some of the trends. So in kitchens, we have this clean, refined look with the look of marble. And this picture here, I couldn't tell you if this was real stone or if it was one of the thin porcelain panels. Uh, but that look is very, very popular. Having backsplash done with slab of stone or slab of porcelain to match countertops is a, a, a big trend. This picture here we discussed and I couldn't tell if it was real stone. And then I noticed if you take a look at the front of the lower cabinets, the fronts of the cabinets were done with the thin porcelain panels as well as the counter and the backsplash. So you can even clad doors with thin porcelain panels. Concrete, the concrete look, the white on beige, or white on gray metallic look is very, very in trend right now. Quartz countertops. So for kitchen countertops and vanity tops, there are three major materials right now is the quartz, agglomerated quartz type products. There's a number of different uh, brands. Um, natural stone, of course, granites, and marbles, and onyx. And there's also the thin porcelain panels. So those are the three trending materials for countertops. Mixing materials. So you can see in this example, the floor is done with a wood grain look porcelain tile. The wall on the right hand side is done with a mosaic. The, the wall on the left is done with a polished porcelain. And the accent wall behind the tub is done with a textured tile. So there's a lot of mixing, especially wood with, with tile. Gauge porcelain panels. I don't know if you went to any of the seminars on the thin porcelain panels, but there is a new standard that came out um, 
Actually, I think it's actually going to come out still. They just gave us a sneak preview of the standard at coverings. So there's a standard for thin porcelain tiles, which are one meter square or smaller. And there's gauge porcelain panels that are, can be as big as one and a half by three meters. And they're between three millimeters and six and a half millimeters in thickness. Those are called gauged porcelain. So terminology, important to make sure we're talking the same thing. It's called gauged porcelain now. So in this case here, uh, this entire bathroom was done with gauged porcelain. Same with this kitchen. The counters, the, the cabinets, the backsplash. They could even have cladded the the doors for the fridge with uh, thin porcelain because it's so light. And you'll notice also the blend of wood in with that look. There's a lot of wood being used in conjunction with tile. This picture here, floors, walls, counters. Even the fume hood is clad with the gauged porcelain panels. The versatility of the product is, is, is amazing. Then there's large format tile. And this is where I'd like to just cover the terminology a little bit. Large, large format tile is any tile that is greater than 15 inches on any side. So 12 by 24 inch. 24 inches is greater than 15, therefore it's a lar considered a large format tile, which is different than gauged porcelain tile or gauged porcelain panels. So in this case here, we have a, a bathroom that was done all with 12 by 24 inch, including the shower floor, walls. So large format tile in shower floors is a, a huge trend. People don't want to stop with their large format tile at the shower and then have to use mosaic or another kind of tile on the floor in the shower. They want the same tile running all the way through. So with lineal drains, like you see here along the wall, lineal drains allow for that type of design to happen. And you have a single slope running to the drain that you can put large format tile or even marble slab, a granite slab, or thin porcelain slab on the floor in the shower. Wood grain tile being used in showers. It's kind of a cool thing to have wood in a shower, but it's really a porcelain tile. And again, here in the shelf, that's all clad with uh, wood look porcelain. Another big major trend is textured. Textured tile, um, I remember I went to a seminar for the, from the uh, Spanish Tile Association and they said texture is the new color. So they're creating design from texture. There was always an issue with having light fixtures that are too close to the wall that accentuate lippage in the tile installation. Well, with textured tile, you want to wash the wall to accentuate the texture of the tile. As in this picture here. Notice that most of the uh, room shots don't have a lot of bright colors. They're all that grayish, mixture between gray and beige. Uh, when I walked through the tile show in, uh, in co coverings in Florida, everything was that that color. So that's the trending colors is that that grayish. <clears throat> well, I'll talk about uh, bathtubs later, but you'll notice also that most of the bathtubs in these shots are standalone tubs. The tub deck type of tubs are fallen out of favor and these are what's trending right now. And you'll notice also the shower has the large format tile on the floor without a curb. Curbless showers is a huge trend. My colleagues in Europe, when I tell them that we build showers with curbs, they look at me like I have two heads on my shoulder and they say, why? Why do you build showers with curbs? 
it's strange to them because the, only in certain circumstances would they ever put a curb in a shower. Printed tiles. So now with the print technology that's available in the tile industry, they have all kinds of great prints that they can print onto the tile. And you can create design and effect with different printed designs. In some cases, they're all different, and you can mix them around um, or use different prints on different surfaces. And you can combine printed tile with textured tile as well which is going to be really cool. One of the upcoming trends in printed tile is uh, the digital printing is going to allow manufacturers to do small batches of custom printing on tile. So that's what's going to be coming probably in the next five years. Right now, production of tile is hundreds of thousands of square feet. So unless you want to order 100,000 square feet of something special, you're not going to get a custom, but this new technology uh, will allow for that. So that's going to be very exciting coming in the future. Mm -hmm. Open concept. In kitchens, everybody understands the design thing of open concepts. It's, it's nothing really new. But that idea of open concept now is coming into the bathrooms as well. So in this situation here, it, you have an open bathroom to the, to the master bedroom. Again, curbless, large format tile, um, and it's all incorporated into one room. So again, curbless showers. Um, I heard the phrase, showers without borders. Very cool. So you see, again, there's no partitions, there's no curbs. And in some cases, there's no glass. It, the shower is just completely open to the, to the room. And I'll go through, actually, this installation, show you how it, was, how it was all constructed in behind the tile, which is very, very important. So you see the lineal drain along the wall, standalone tub, uh, just back up here. You'll also notice on the left is a wall-mounted toilet. Okay, that is a major trend in bathroom design. Instead of having that hole in the floor where water can seep through into the floor below, the toilets are mounted on the wall. The tank is built into the wall cavity, so there's no visible tank. And on the left-hand side, sorry, on the right-hand side, you'll see the vanity is also wall-hung so it's not sitting on the floor of the, of the bathroom. So if that floor were to flood, there's no damage because everything's up off the floor. You want to clean the floor, you could go in there with a bucket of water, dump it on the floor, take out a, a scrub brush or a mop, slop it all around, suck it up with a wet vac. And that's the European type of design that's coming here. Steam showers. Yeah, commercially, we call them steam rooms, dedicated rooms for steam. And then residentially, we call them steam showers because it's a dual purpose. It's a steam room and a shower. So in this case, you see the, the oops. See, when I want to advance the slide, I get the laser pointer. So you can see there's a control for the steam. When dealing with steam showers or steam rooms, proceed with extreme caution because steam can get into the smallest little hole. Okay? And I've gone through a lot. I put a steam shower into my own home and I went through a lot of the, 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 the trials and tribulations of steam rooms and I learned a lot. It was a great learning experience. I even found out that CSA doesn't have any standards for light fixtures for steam rooms. So he's kind of, I don't know, use whatever you want. That was scary. So I didn't put a light fixture in my, my steam shower at home. I put lights outside that are angled in towards through the glass and into the steam room or steam shower. 
so that I wouldn't have any pe penetrations through my vapor barrier. Anyways, if anybody's interested in steam rooms, I could do an hour and a half presentation just on steam rooms. So if you are uh, doing steam rooms or steam, steam showers, contact me um, outside of the presentation. I'll be happy to help you. But that is a trending thing for sure. So here's another steam room. Um, wet rooms, the terminology of wet room is something that's trending as well. So you're designing a room, the entire bathroom is as a wet room. And in Europe, that's what they call a washroom. We say washroom or bathroom, they say wet room. Because there's no real distinction between where the wetness stops and where it starts, so they waterproof the entire, entire bathroom, which is a very, very smart idea. Lineal drains. Lineal drains, in my opinion, are going to be what, let's say, probably 60% of the market in the next five to 10 years. The people that won't want lineal drains are the ones that can't afford them. But lineal drains is the way to go. All the Fairmont hotels, the Shangri-La, all the high-end hotels are putting in lineal drains in their showers. And when people see that in the high-end hotels, that's what they want in their home and you'll see a big, big trend towards lineal drains. So there's different designs. There's, there's you know, metallic look with holes. There's uh, um, ones that are almost invisible that you can put tile on. There's ones with patterns. I've seen one that has LED lights in it. So when water hits the drain, the lights go on. I don't know if that's really trending, but it's kind of cool. <laughs> Um, the neat thing is, is the single slope. So when, when you're dealing with a lineal drain, you have a drain that runs basically across the whole width of the shower, and now you have only one slope running to the drain. That allows you to use a tile as big as you want. You could put one tile on the entire bathroom or shower floor. When you have a point drain, a single drain, then you have multiple slopes. You cannot have one piece of tile creating multiple slopes. So that's the reason why you end up with mosaics, you know, four by four, sometimes six by six, but nothing much bigger than that. Whereas with lineal drains, it's a single plane. You can put whatever size tile you want. And that's one of the big reasons for the trend towards lineal drains. So you can put the drain in the middle of the floor. You can put it against the wall. And you could put it even where the curb would normally be and have the water running towards the entrance of the shower. The other thing that these designs accomplish is now that you have a drain in the bathroom floor. So if the bath or the toilet overflowed or the sink flooded the room, the water can then go into the drain that's at the entrance of the shower. All you need to do is put a raised threshold at the entrance to the bathroom to keep the water from going into the hall, and you have a drain in the floor of your bathroom. If you've waterproofed the entire bathroom as a wet room, you have a drain that's connected to all your waterproofing. I love technology when it works. So here's a lineal drain that has a tileable grate. So basically, the, in, in, with a wood grain look like that, with the lines of the, the wood grain, the seam basically disappears, so it's uh, almost an invisible drain. Niches are another trending item. Uh, we used to put niches in showers many years ago. They leaked, caused all kinds of dam water damage. So people got away from niches and started using surface-mounted soap dishes, corner caddies, whether they're ceramic or made out of metal or whatever. Now niches are coming back because there's manufacturers out there that manufacture prefabricated niches. All they have to be done is inserted into the wall and they are 100% watertight. So they will never ever leak. So the niche has come back in a big way. The ni other nice thing that I've noticed about niches is when you have a soap dish that's sticking out of a shower, especially if it's a smaller shower, it takes up space. Even though it may only be six inches off the wall, but if you only have a 30-inch wide shower, that six inches is a lot of real estate. 
So if you're using space inside the wall cavity, you've gained space inside your shower. Chrome fixtures are still trending. Been trending for what, 50 years? <laughs> Floating benches in showers. This is another huge trend. Uh, when I was at Coverings, uh, most of the booths that were showing off their tile and in a shower format were showing floating benches. You know, take a look at this. You've got large format tile on the floor. Notice how they had to cut the large format tile to make it the multiple slopes go to the point drain. The vanity is, uh, behind the vanity there is a textured tile. Okay, glass floor to ceiling and a floating bench with large format tile in the wall. So these are all the trends that I've talked about all encompassed in one, one application. So here's a, another floating bench that's covered with a marble mosaic. Vanities and toilets mounted on a cantilevered from the wall. This is a huge, huge trend right now. And I think it's very functional too because water, if it ever flooded the floor, would never damage the, the cabinetry. See on the left is a wall-mounted toilet. Again, wall-mounted toilet and a shower that's open to the rest of the room. Heated floors. In some, in some market areas, I talk to tile dealers and installers, and they say it's over 50% of the tiled floors they do are done with heated. That's a huge trend. So people like to walk on the floor and not have their feet get cold. And everybody likes puppies, so I threw this slide in. So there's basically two ways of heating the floor. One is with electric cable, and the other is with hydronic tubing. Hydronic tubing runs, uh, it has a boiler that runs water, hot water or uh, food grade glycol through the tubing that then heats the floor. Uh, the hydronic systems are always gonna be uh, an inch and a half thick, so they, they're not adaptable to single room applications. They're typically the heating system for the entire building. So you're gonna heat your house with hydronic and floor heat. The entire floor is covered, every room, with the system. Electric floor warming, I call it electric floor warming because it's there just to warm the floor so that when you walk on the floor with bare feet, your feet are comfortable. So the very, both floors are warm, but they're warm, built differently and for different reasons. Glass partitions is another huge trend. And the glass partitions are done now floor to ceiling. Um, and they basically have gone and replaced wall partitions and showers. Where we used to build wall partitions to create a shower space, now those spaces are defined by glass. Or they're open completely, like in some of the other pictures. Such as here. So in this case here, they just slope the floor to the line drain, put a, a track for the glass, and there's your shower. It's open on the far end. There's no door, there's no curb, and the look of the floor just flows from the bathroom straight through, through, through the shower. And you can see on the right-hand side here, there's a, where the slope is to the line drain. There is a pitch difference between the flat floor in the bathroom and the sloped floor in the shower. And again, the drain can replace the curb at the entrance. So let's take a look at some of the installation and how these designs can be accomplished. So large gauge porcelain tile 
and we talked about it at the beginning. There are new standards. So if you want to write down the new ANSI standard, that will be, that will be available uh, to purchase from the, the website. And there's a standard for the tile, and there's a standard for the installation of the tile. So if you're getting involved with large gauge porcelain panels, especially the panels, I would suggest that you get that standard and read the proper installation method, whether you're the installer, the retailer, consumer, specifier. Know the standard, okay? Because if it's done according to the standard, you will be a happy person. If it's done by <clears throat> some other method, you may not be, you may not be happy. And they're very, they're, they're not cheap installations. But they're beautiful. The, 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 those large porcelain panels are amazing. So here's an open concept picture I showed before. And let's take a look at what goes in on behind the installation of the tile to make this actual a functional waterproof bathroom. So you can see on the right-hand side, the door on the left on the right-hand side is where the shower is going to be. You see the shower, the pipe coming through the ceiling for the rain head. So all of those surfaces have been waterproofed with a surface waterproofing membrane. And the difference between that and the traditional shower installation method, the traditional system uses a rubber liner. The rubber liner system is based on, they call it a pan, shower pan. So the pan has four sides. The shower is built inside that pan, so when water gets into the tile or behind the tile and runs down, it runs inside the four sides of the pan. Okay, and the pan is connected to the drain. So the water then runs to the drain and down the drain pipe. That's the basic shower liner system. You cannot use that in this type of a design because where are the four sides of your shower? You have two walls. That's great. You can run the liner up the two walls. What about the other two sides? You can't use that system. If you look at the TTMAC installation manual, there is no detail in the manual for a curbless shower using the rubber liner system. Go to the American standards. Doesn't exist. So to achieve these designs, you have to go away from the traditional rubber liner system and use a surface waterproofing system, as you see in this, in this photo. So you can see the rest of the bathroom floor was also waterproofed with a different membrane. It's flashed up onto the walls everywhere, so if the floor was to flood, water wouldn't wick into the walls. And now this surface is waterproof. Waterproof and water impermeable. Hmm. Some people think waterproof means water impermeable. Not necessarily. So things that allow water to pass through could be considered waterproof because they don't break down when they get wet. But they still let water through. Good example, cement board. Cement board, you can put in a bucket of water and leave it there for a month, it won't break down. So is it waterproof? It's definitely not water impermeable. It'll allow water through. It'll soak up water. It'll hold water. And that's not a good thing for a wet area. So in this situation, we're going to be bonding the tile directly to the waterproofing. So the only, surf, the only material that gets wet is the tile, the grout, and the thin layer of bonding mortar behind the tile. And as you know, anything that is thin will dry out quickly. Anything that's thick is going to take a long time to dry out. These are thin systems that dry out quickly. I'm going to mention movement joints one more time in the presentation because it is one of the most forgotten installation aspects of tile. I don't want movement joints. I don't like the way they look, so don't put them in. 
and then you have a problem with a tile installation. And it's a bad tile installer, you didn't do a good job, but you need movement joints. So all the inside corners in tile installations should be movement joints. They should allow for movement. What happens when you grout the inside corner of a, of a tile installation? After a while, there's a crack there. Why is there a crack? Because there's movement. You have to allow for that movement. So let's take a look at, uh, this is the finished installation from, from this picture. So you can see where the, the drain for the tub is going to come through the floor. It just has to waterproof between the pipe, the drain pipe and the floor to create a complete waterproof floor system for the finished result here. It's actually an easy installation for an amazing design. So here's another, this uh, is an interesting story. This is your typical, you know, five foot wide bathroom that's uh, eight, ten feet deep, you know, standard. And the installer goes in to do the, to the bathroom renovation to find that there was an inch or more of slope from one side of the bathroom to the other. So normally what would you do? Level the floor. But if you level the floor, now the hallway is going to be at a different angle than the flat floor in the bathroom. So it creates another problem. So they created this design by putting the line drain on the left-hand side of the room against the wall, which is the low part of the sloping floor. They didn't have to even build a slope into the floor. They just waterproof the floor and you have a natural pitch to the wall. So there was, and this, this, this actually won an award so let's take a look at what's in behind. Oh. Sorry. Okay, we're going to look at this job now. <laughs> so here you have a, a shower on the right, large format tile throughout, um, cantilevered vanities on the left. Um, and this is what was done to waterproof the floor. The membrane on the left-hand side is also an uncoupling membrane, so it could be applied directly on the 5.8 subfloor without having to build up the floor a lot, and it creates waterproofing as well. So the floor is waterproof, the shower is pitched to the line drain at the wall, and you'll notice the two niches on the wall above the uh, mixing valves. And these are the prefabricated niches that we was talking about. You just have to cut out the wall board and insert the niche between the studs. And there's the lineal drain on the floor. Very simple and very easy to construct, but a very modern and trending design. Wet rooms. Here's, here's a project where they have an actual hot tub in the, uh, in the floor and they went and built it. The carpenter came in and built it out of a lot of wood. Oh, wooden tile, not the best materials to combine because wood twists and warps and whatnot. So they put the uncoupling membrane on top to isolate the tile from the wood moving, uh, protect the wood from the moisture and uh, create an uh, acceptable surface for the tile to be installed. And you'll notice on the right-hand side, there is a shower that's open to the rest of the room. So again, the whole room has to be treated as a wet room. Another thing that's as, as a building material for tile that allows some of these designs to be done is foam building panels. There's a number of companies that have panels made out of foam and a waterproof surface that can be used as structure to build things in your shower. They come in various different thicknesses for different types of uses. I have actually an appointment this afternoon to consult with a guy building a commercial steam room and instead of building the, the two-tiered benches out of concrete blocks, we're gonna build the benches out of foam board. 
So the supporting structure and the surface is going to be built out of foam board. Lightweight, easy to use, easy to cut, easy to work with. So there's a, most of it goes together with adhesive or with thin-set mortar and cuts on a table saw like, like nothing. So you can rip pieces, cut them on angles, do whatever you want, build it out of the board, and it's structural. You don't need any framing to create the benches. So here's, here's a project that um, you can see on the left-hand side, there's two layers of board glued together to create a partition wall. Curve the board to create a curved bench in the corner, and the curved bench acts as a support for the wall. Uh, on the bottom right-hand corner is another partition wall made out of two layers of two-inch board. And the walls are clad with half-inch board. So there it is, with everything waterproofed. So all the partition walls and the bench are all built from foam board. So there it is, a finished picture with the tile and the marble on top of the partition wall and the glass. It's very easy with the foam board also to create curves. I've seen complete circular showers built out of only foam board. Imagine the design, you could create a spiral shower in the middle of a room with a rain head coming from the ceiling. And the construction is very, very easy. This is uh, the floating bench, and this was built out of foam board. Two layers of two inch, and you can see on the left-hand side there's a cable coming out of the wall, so we put electric heat in the bench and electric heat on the wall behind the bench, so when somebody sits down on the bench, it's nice and warm and you can lean on the wall. And you'll see also the strapping on the floor for electric cable as well. So the floor of the shower is heated, the bench is heated, and the wall in behind is heated. There's electric heated floors, is, like I said, is a huge trend. There's basically two, two different ways of achieving. One is a mat format for heat that have fixed sizes, and they can make custom size mats as well. Or you can buy cable and by using strapping run the cable back and forth between the strapping which then requires a self-leveling material to be put on top. Recently um, mats and coupling membranes have come out that accept the floor warming cables so the matting acts as your underlayment uncoupling holds the cable in place as well. So in areas where there is no cable the elevation stays the same and it saves a tremendous amount of construction time and therefore cost. One of the things about these, these systems is that you can plan out any area to be heated. You're not stuck having a certain size or a certain area. You can heat whatever areas you want. The other thing that's come out into the market recently is a thermal break for the heated floors. In a lot of cases, you put the heated floor in a basement because the concrete floor in the basement is cold. But the concrete's so thick that it sucks out a lot of the heat out of the cable, and it takes maybe th you know, six, seven hours for the floor to come up to temperature. So now we have membranes or thermal breaks that can be used underneath that will increase the heating time by 75%. So instead of taking six, seven hours, it's going to take one, two hours to heat up the tile. Heated shower floors. Okay. So now one of the things about heated shower floors is the heat cable has to be underneath the waterproofing. Okay. You don't want the cable to get wet. I have no interest in hearing anybody getting electrocuted. Okay. Our industry is quite safe. <laughs> Don't need any problems with electrocution. So, you know, here's, a, here's an installation where he's raised the floor height in the bathroom by about an inch to accommodate the slope of the shower without having to cut into the subfloor. 
So you see here on the right-hand side, all the floor has been raised by using the foam panel boards to get the elevation right for the slope to the line drain. And then the membrane that accepts the heat gets put into the shower as well as the rest of the bathroom floor. The lineal drain up against the wall. The walls were done with the foam board as well. The cable gets installed and in only areas where they're not going to be covered. So you can see the right-hand side in the top left corner picture. There's no cable because that's where the, that's where the bathtub is going to go. In the far left corner is the area of the vanity, so you don't put any heating there either. It's all covered with thinset, and he waterproofed all the electric cable with the membrane. So the cable is not going to be exposed to any water exposure. And there's the finished job. Again, if you take a look at some of the trends, glass, floor to ceiling, there's no partition walls for the shower, there's niches in the wall, there's large format tile on the floor and on the walls, the use of a lineal drain, and it's a curbless shower. The vanity, I believe, is cantilevered from the wall, and it's a standalone tub. So again, these, these, these trends just keep repeating in all these projects. I said I was going to talk about movement joints twice, right? You have to remember movement joints are very, very, very important. There's two reasons. One is that the tile itself is going to move from temperature changes, but also the substrate underneath is moving. So, for example, in a small bathroom or a kitchen, if you bind the tile between two walls, those walls are made out of two by six. Now they get a humid day, Two by sixes absorb the humidity, they're going to grow. They're going to now push on the tile from both sides. You don't need a lot of movement to create a tremendous amount of stress on the tile that causes the tile to want to pop up. And I wanted to put a video in here from YouTube that shows exactly that. Go to YouTube and put, type in um, tile floor exploding and you'll see multiple videos of people actually catching their floor explode up because of lack of movement joints. You hear this crackling, crackle, 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 and then poof, the tile tents up. The substrate got smaller than the tile. What's going to happen? The tile has to blow off the floor. Movement joints are essential, especially when you have heated floors because it, Two major causes of movement is temperature changes and moisture changes. So if you heat a floor, you're creating the movement by cycling the heat on and off. So movement joints are extremely important. You can use caulking or you can use a prefabricated movement joint. So there's the prefabricated movement joint or the caulking in the previous picture. I do for time. Oh, my God. Right on time. So that concludes my presentation. I hope you enjoyed uh, and learned something today. Um, I will be taking questions. So there's a microphone there in the middle aisle. So if there's any questions that you'd like to ask, uh, step up to the microphone and don't be shy. Come on. Somebody ask a question. Well, two, two uh, things of... Oh, oh, there's a question. Thank you. Sorry, just one question. In one of the slides you showed the, where they had the one-inch difference in level of the floor, so it worked to put in the curbless shower, but what about if you don't have the one-inch? And I didn't think one-inch would be enough of a slope for even with a linear drain. Uh, the slope requirement for shower is a quarter-inch per foot. So if you have, let's say, a four-foot shower right. to the drain, so you, you need an inch of of uh, a slope. Okay. So there is ways of creating that height differential. But you could raise the floor you... in the bathroom or you can lower the floor in the shower area. 
But so that means that at the entrance to the bathroom, then otherwise you're going to have an inch, which, I mean, you don't want that either. So can you cheat and sort of maybe gradually go up and then go down? There's, 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 there's ways of doing that. If, if, for example, if you're going to be putting hard, three-quarter inch hardwood in the hallway, okay, and there's going to be a height differential based on the thickness of the tile, mm -hmm. uh, there's slope transitions you can use. Or you could even put, in one case, a gentleman covered the entire floor of his house with half-inch plywood to raise up the, the hardwood floor so it would match out with the, with the bathroom floor. And I said, well, how much did that cost you? He said, about 500 bucks. And now you have a, you have a as opposed to... Uh, risking the installation of the tile by doing something Weird. not quite right. Okay. Thank you. So a couple of housekeeping things here. Uh, please visit the, uh, the show, show floor. Those of you that want CEU units, uh, make sure that you are scanned for this presentation because some of you may have stayed from the last one and you need to be scanned for both presentations, so, so assure that. A uh, reminder that the show will be open between, uh, up until 4 o'clock today, and we'll be doing demos um, on the demo stage on the far end of the show, uh, starting at 1 o'clock. And we'll be showing an installation of a curbless shower at 1 o'clock um, on the demo stage, so go take a look at that. There we can talk about proprietary products. All right, so enjoy the show. Thanks for coming to my presentation.